open to the uh, Matthew chapter 5. Kim, before we go on the overhead with it, I want to read it out of my Bible, and, uh, and then we'll use it in this other translation in a second, okay? Matthew chapter 5. I, I believe when I'm testing the air, the atmosphere, whatever your environment, I, I say, God, now give me a word that will speak to the hearts of the people and the situation that we're in. And uh, again, when Pastor Joseph sent me a message about our teenagers, the, the breakthrough, I was praying for certain teenagers, and I saw where God did some great things in their life. And one of the best things for me is to see our uh, staff that went with him to catch it and learn it. I was 19, almost 19 when I got saved, so I wasn't able to go to youth camp. I didn't know there was such a thing. In my first youth camp, I went to me and a guy named Catfish and another dude. Catfish was a local drug dealer that got saved in North Alabama. And we took some old motorcycles and turned them into choppers. Now, they weren't Harleys, Keith. They were Hondas and Yamahas. And, and uh, we drove up to a place called Hole in Wald, Tennessee. You know what that is, H? It's not Hole in the Wall. It's Hole in Wald, Tennessee. And that's where the camp was. And we rode up there to the camp. To, uh, to see what was going on because we knew all these teenagers and churches had gone there. Well, we rolled in, and we rode through a rainstorm to get there. And when we got up there, being from North Alabama, we had to go into Tennessee. When we got there, uh, the, the bikes were so loud that when we pulled up, these church kids thought a bike gang had showed up, and fear had gripped them. And, uh, man, it wasn't but a couple of guys who had just gotten saved and come off drugs and alcohol and, and just wanted to be around the presence of the Lord. And that kind of started my passion to want to be in camp. Now, I've been preaching and doing camps for now 40 years. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, three years, I preached youth camps all over America. I would go in one, one summer, I preached 10 youth camps in one summer. Amen. I just boing, 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 boing. And every one of them I saw revival. I saw awakening. I saw hunger. I saw kids' lives change, so much so that I went back to those churches during the year and saw God still turning their lives around. One young man got saved. His life got turned around. And uh, when I go back to Alabama, I cross a bridge. It's named after him. He was killed in a head-on wreck, head-on uh, collision right after he got born again. So you don't know what happens at camp that changes the lives of people and turns them around, and you don't know what tomorrow holds. So you want to grab hold of that. The Scripture says in Matthew 5, I'm going to read this out of the New International Version, and then we'll share it with you out of the message. Jesus, uh, the Beatitudes are simply great attitudes. It's the one thing you can change. Yeah. It's other people can affect you, but you can change your attitude. Amen. If you change your attitude, it affects everything about you. So now when he, uh, the scripture says, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, excuse me, I, 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 just, like, I just saw a revelation. Now we're Bible. You know, oftentimes we think somebody's got to be running, jumping over the pews, and I, I do that too. But then I read the Word, and I see where Jesus said that he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. Patsy, I think about you and so many others when I read that Scripture, that there is comfort ahead, but mourning is okay. It's okay to mourn for those that you've lost and the things you've lost. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful. They'll be shown mercy. Mercy is its own reward. When you show mercy to somebody, you get mercy back. When you are not head mean and you mean toward people, you're going to get meanness back. Some people keep wondering why they keep getting us beat up. That's because you have been mean, but learn to be someone of mercy. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. 
because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Then when I read that, blessed are you when people insult you. <laughs> I, I have been the, the brunt of over a million views on YouTube over the last few weeks where people have found an old clip of me from 15 years ago when I shot the Easter Bunny. Yeah, I did that. That's me. People keep sending me. I've had messages all week. Is this you? Is this you? Because I looked pretty young then. <laughs> and I just kind of laugh about it because if you know me, yes, I shot the Easter Bunny. And then I told somebody to get him out of the church. Santa Claus came in, and I shot him in the backside. And people who don't know me think somehow that was uh, anti-God, and they've been insulting. I had one, one young man call me a heretic. That means somebody doesn't speak the truth. So I sent him a message because I knew him. I sent him. I don't read all the comments. I can't. There's a couple of thousand of them. But I picked up on one. I sent him a message. As soon as I did, he apologized immediately. Because you can hide behind things on the Internet. Amen. You can just say things and, and insult people and put them down. So when I read this thing, what Jesus said, in the message it says it like this. And by the way, I quit looking at it because I'm, I'm uh, that YouTube thing. I'm just listen. I, I can't shoot a gun in church. Fifteen years ago, I could shoot a gun, Steve, in church, and nobody got upset about it. Now you do it, you better duck because things have changed. Society has shifted that fast. Amen. So I'm smart enough not to do it right now. Uh, when Jesus uh, saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed to a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. I love that. They were apprenticed to him, committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and talked his climbing companions, this is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care at the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. When you can see God in the outside world, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of uh, competing or fighting. That's when you discover who you really are and you're placing God's family. I, this morning I want to preach a thought called, How's Your Appetite? How is your, the scripture said, we're going to use this one verse. We're going to pick up on, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for right things, righteousness, for they shall be filled. So the question, it has to be, how is your appetite? How are you doing? You know, when I think of that scripture, blessed are they which hunger and thirst, this spiritual hunger is aching to the physical. It can be filled, but soon the hunger for more returns for more God. I'm a seeker. Man, ever since I got born again, I've been seeking for the things of God, what's going on in the house of God, how do people react to the presence of God, amen, through college, through 30 years of pastoring, on any given day, I'm aware of a longing in my life, hungry places that ache to be filled. I think of the scripture, blessed they that hunger and thirst, and, and some days I'm aware of God, some days I yearn for him, I long for family. Amen. I come from a small family. So when I met the house of God, amen, it was like this family became very large for me. Amen. Uh, on other days, I'm aloof, realizing the strength of my newly found solitude, the pains of my past, a distant memory. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst. Then boom, old wounds resurface, and I become suspicious and self-protective. Every ever just want uh, things to be right, long for it to the point it turns to impatience and frustration. You ever just kind of want everything to be right, your family to be right, church to be right, people to be right, and you just get this anticipation for it to happen, and it seems like it takes a while, and then you get hungry for it again. You get hungry for right things and thirsty. It is here where Christ gives a word to the seeker. People like you and me who are baffled by the ongoing presence of hunger and thirst in our spiritual pilgrimage. Many times we come to church, we're not hungry. You go to camp, you're not hungry. But if you get an appetite for God, it doesn't have to be filled on a Sunday. 
They can be filled on a Monday. Amen. When you're just hungry for him. As believers, we believe that God is alive. We believe that he's active in our lives. And in the world, he's not sitting on some throne somewhere. He just spun the world and said, all right, y'all take care of yourself. I believe God intervenes. I believe God shows up. I believe whenever you're after God and you're hungry for God, he said, if I hunger and thirst, he'll fill me. Amen. He'll do something inside of me. We have seen evidence of God's power at work from the Old Testament accounts of God's miraculous interventions in the lives of his people to the powerful revivals that have swept across the world, drawing millions of people to faith in Christ. We've seen our young people blessed at camp. Ford's youth had a powerful awakening at camp. There are powerful moments in the lives of our kids and youth. Our prayer is that it would last that it would just keep on going, that it wouldn't just happen today, but you'd keep on remembering. Listen, I want to walk you through some things maybe you've never thought of or seen before. I'm going to move quickly. If you want to snap a picture, you can. But the word revival simply means awakening. This morning, it took me a minute. How many know how early this service is? To wake up, to remind yourself. That, that clock went off, and I punched it again. Time it, and I punched it again. That's just five minutes. But I'm praying for a long five minutes. Yeah. Amen. And then the awakening and getting the eye boogers out of my eye and, and standing up and stretching and, and feeling that body ache from a whole week of camp. And I think to myself, God, we need an awakening in the house of God. We need it in our lives. When I look back at revival through life, Pentecost started 30 AD after the death of Christ. Amen. 30 years after Peter. Amen. Sit on the day of Pentecost, he preached, and thousands got saved. In Ephesus, Paul, the book of Acts, all, when you read the book of Acts, it's, it's an awakening after an awakening after an awakening. First happens in the life of a person, then in a group of people. Then there was a pre-Reformation revival, 1300 to 1500. I want you to notice the distance between uh, 30 A.D. and 1300 A.D. There were dark ages. There was times when there was no move of God. People were trying to reinvent religion. They were putting a, a, a yoke on people to do things uh, according to what they saw in maybe the Old Testament. They didn't understand it, but all of a sudden revival. Everybody say revival. It broke out. This guy named Wycliffe, he, he translated and put together the first Bible. Now that Bible went out, but it was only for the priest. It wasn't for the people. That's what's wrong. Amen. Everybody needs a Bible. Amen. Then there was a guy named John Huss who, who preached the gospel. And they took him and they tied him to a stick. Amen. A stake. And they burned him for preaching the gospel, for, for just sharing it. Then you move on a little bit, and you see another uh, awakening that took place. Stay up with me, Kim. Amen. Uh, the Reformation in 1517, Martin Luther, a German, went to the house, to the, to the uh, um, what was it say, the Wittenberg door, cathedral door, and what he saw was indulgences among the Catholic church that said that if you died, H.D., if you died, and you was a heathen, I mean, sorry, no good heathen, you would go to a place called purgatory. Then D, because she loved your pitiful self, amen, would, would go to the priest, and she'd give money to the priest, and that was called indulgences. And if she could give enough money to the priest, the priest would release your spirit and soul to go to heaven. That was known as indulgences. And because of that, you can see the corruption in the church. It was all about fear. I can't get to heaven unless Miss Linda prays Ken in and gives enough money to get him. So what happened to the poor? The poor couldn't get nobody to heaven, and everybody started believing this. And all of a sudden, Martin Luther, he reads this thing out of the book of Romans that the just shall live by faith. Amen. That were saved by faith. Faith. It's not about the money I give. Amen. It's by faith. It's not by the works I do. It's by faith. And he wrote these 95 theses all about faith, and he nailed them to the door. And what happened was a reformation brought forth, and it was known as the Protestant movement. That's who we are, Protestants. Prote it doesn't matter if you Baptist, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, whatever. But Protestants all came from the word protesters. See, we don't do enough protesting. Amen. Things that we just swallow things hook, line, and sinker. That's why I invite you to take whatever I preach, take it and look at it real good and see what's happening there. So he did that. Then John Calvin and then Knox. And so we just keep on moving here. These are just names of people you can look up. The First Great Awakening, 1727, 1750. Uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. Amen. Whitfield was preaching to the coal miners in Kentucky. This guy would stand on, a, on a, just a little box or something. Whitfield's the first guy that brought music through the church. Amen. Amen. He sent it down through the town to make people pay attention to what was going on. 
See, we didn't always have what we got today. This all came little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, glory to glory. It all came a little bit at a time. Whitfield was preaching. Such revival broke out that, listen, this is the crazy stuff, and this is what you need to pick up on. Even the mules that pulled the carriages that hauled the coal out of the mine, even the mules, the old men used to curse them and kick them and beat them. But what happened during the time of Whitfield, such revival broke out that if you cursed the mule, he wouldn't go anywhere. You had to bless the mule, say nice things to the mule, then the mule moved. I'm thinking to myself, even the revival was affected uh, the animals. Can I get an amen? Amen. And as I walked, I mean, I started walking through this thing and realizing that the first camp meeting took place in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And what happened there was it was black and white. They're getting together, and they couldn't, black couldn't go to a white church, amen, so they went out in the woods, and they built these camp meetings, just where the first camp meeting took place, and the thing that took place that manifested there was shouting. Now, that's amazing to me, but they began to shout in the church, and the awakening took place. Everybody give me a shout. <laughs> See, amen, they couldn't do that in the early church. It had to be real quiet. Everybody had to be still. But all of a sudden, he shouting took place, and, the, and, and this uh, reconciliation between black and white took place, and people started getting together. Then the general awakening, 1830, Charles Finney, it took place in Hawaii and Jamaica. I'm just telling you, God, you were using these people to make things happen. The Layman's Revival in 1857, there was D.L. Moody in Chicago. He started the Sunday school. So revival broke out there among Moody, and he said, people need to be taught. Now, Sunday school wasn't taught to teach you more Bible. Sunday school was taught to teach you reading, writing, and arithmetic because people didn't get reading, writing, and arithmetic. We didn't have public schools then. So the church took it on them to be able to teach people reading, writing, and arithmetic. You learn that, and then you'd go to church. Well, we just kept that going and added one more Sunday and one more class. <laughs> that's what we did in our churches. Okay, and that's what happens. Oftentimes, there's a movement of God, and then we stop making a monument out of it. Amen. That was never God's intention. Amen. Then in 1904, revival beginning in Wales, Evan Roberts, Korea, Moravian. Amen. Korea broke out in revival, all these things. Azusa Street. There was this guy named uh, uh, Seymour. Well, Joseph Seymour. This guy was a black gentleman who preached the gospel in Houston, and they literally run him out of here. He went to Kansas. He went up to Kansas, and when he got there, he heard there was a, a man that was teaching on the fullness of God, the, the blessings of God, amen, the Holy Spirit in, in infusion of God. So he went up there to hear this guy named Paul, uh, Palmer, Palmer or something like that, and the guy told him, you're black. He said, I know. He said, you can't be in this class. He said, but I'm hungry. I want, I want to know more. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll do. Set outside the school, the college, by an open window and listen to my lectures. See, we don't even think like that today. People act like, like, like life has is, 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 is shifted so much and look how bad I got it. This man said, okay, I'll do it because I'm so hungry for God. I'll sit outside the class as the only black man in this college and listen to the gospel. Amen. And he sat out there and when it rained, they let him come into the hallway with the door cracked. And he listened to the gospel. Amen. And with all that hunger, he left and he went to a place in Los Angeles known as Azusa, Azusa Street. He met at a lady's house and he began to preach the gospel there. And as he did, people started showing up. And so much so, it lined up. In this one little house, 300 people showed up in this house. Then all of a sudden, revival broke out there. It's known, you can look it up, it's, it's historical, the Azusa Street revival. And when it broke forth, literally thousands of people were given their lives of Christ. That guy from Kansas, the teacher, he showed up there. When he got there, he was upset and mad. Why? Because he saw black and white sitting in church together. And William Seymour said, you can't stop what God's doing here. I ain't in Kansas no more. Come on, give me an amen. Amen. Revival had broke out. And literally, there was one time that it shook. The building shook so hard that even the fire department was called. They saw fire lit up on top. It wasn't that. It was just a manifestation of God. Now, I've watched people on social media now that I'm on there. Amen. I've watched them make fun of the things that go on in church. Now, I don't know. I can't tell you. Some things I see and I go, I don't know, that looks like flesh. Other things I see, I know that's God. I can tell you in my life, I've tried to discern which is right. 
Amen. I've seen people uh, fall under the presence of God. I've seen them roll at camp. I said, one kid rolling in camp. He rolling back and forth. I remember I scotched him with one foot. A friend of mine scotched him with the other. We held him there because he's full of flesh. He's showing out in front of the girls. But then I've been in other places where people were trying to mimic what they saw on TV. Like, like that guy that blow on people and they fall down. Man, I, I had a guy come into church one time. We had a folk lined up across the front. Hey, Amen. He was blowing on people. He was trying to knock them down by blowing on them. Hey, man, and he blew so hard, I was standing behind him to pray over folk. And when I did, he spit his gum. Almost hit me, man. I had to do it. I laid hands on a woman one time. She went down, amen, and church broke her ankle. I quit doing that. I'm so careful now, amen. But you don't know what kind of manifestations are going to break forth in church. You have no idea. I had a friend here in this town who was known as the town alcoholic, amen. His whole life had been nothing but uh, drinking, drinking. His name was Jack, amen. Remember Jack? Amen. And we had church there in a little, in a little barn over here. One service, and my pastor was there, Mike Van Brinson, and he laid hands on Jack. Jack, big man, amen. And when he laid hands on Jack, and I knew it wasn't fake, Jack went to the floor. I mean, he went down. And I looked at Jack, and he had his arm out like this. And I, I said, Jack, what are you doing? He said, I'm holding on to this pole. There wasn't no pole. He's scared to death. He fixed to slide off into somewhere. Listen, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't know what God's going to do in the life of our teenagers, our adults, our kids. You know, in, in the time of Pentecost, and speaking in other tongues and other languages that other people could understand them. They knew that, that God was in the house. You know, sometimes we get so stoic. We get so, we're, we're concerned about what other people are going to say about us. Yeah. Amen. So be, just when you get in the house, understand you're in the house. Now, I can't always help that we're on TV and things of that nature. Listen, if it was up to me, it wouldn't be any of that. I'd say you got to get in this house. But now I know that we're reaching people. We're reaching a vast audience. Don't get mad. Don't shut me off. But I'm just saying that you don't know what God's going to do. Amen. Seymour just kept preaching. And when I think about the awakening that's taking place in our area here, you've you got to stay with it. The World War II revival, almost after every war, there was revival. Amen. God caused it to happen. After 9-11, there was revival. In our churches, it was an awakening. Didn't last long, but every church was full. I know because ours was. Amen. Every church filled up. People were afraid something was going to happen. Billy Graham preaching, Duncan Campbell in New Zealand. Then the baby, baby boomer revival, 1965, 1970. The Jesus people, amen, coming right out of the beaches in Los Angeles. It, it went all the way to uh, uh, Florida. Many of you went and saw that movie. What was it called? Jesus Revolution, amen, that took place. How about in 1970, there was a revival broke out in, in a place in Kentucky known as Asbury College, 1970. Last year, Asbury College went through it again. Amen, another revival took place. Some people in this church were even there. There are characteristics to revival. Sometimes you say revival, you think it's just one type of thing. No, it's not. There's repentance revivals. There's revivals where you have an appetite for God, amen, and you want God more, so you repent. Repent means to get back in the high place of God, amen. It emphasizes the cleansing in your life. There was evangelism revival where people just started getting saved, amen. Uh, Skip, I was involved in that here in Crosby years ago when our church exploded here. It was evangelism. People just kept coming and getting saved, amen. Some would go to other churches after that was fine, but they wanted to hear the gospel, amen. They gave their lives to Christ. Then there was a, a worship revival that takes place. When it's such an emphasis now within our, the church world, but it, that's what happened in Asbury. It was a worship revival. Amen. People just came and just sat around the presence of God. They would sit for hours and hours and hours just worshiping God. Everything else didn't matter anymore. There's deeper life revivals. It experiences God's indwelling. Spiritual warfare revival. I, I heard Justin tell me, man, he felt like the devil bit after him with a hammer jack this week. Amen. Because they had such revival. Anytime. God starts blessing, Satan starts messing. Amen. I, I can tell you with our kids, our youth, our adults, anytime God does something in your life, prepare yourself because trouble's coming. Amen. You've got to get ready for it. There's a Holy Spirit revival about extensive manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You don't know what's going to happen. Amen. I have seen some stuff. I have been involved in some stuff. And again, my discernment is always, is this spirit, is this flesh? Amen. God, what are you doing here? The reconciliation, what does our nation need right now is a reconciliation revival. Where this issue with race is resolved, yeah. culture resolved, I just look for something I got in common with people. If we got Jesus in common, we good. Reconciliation, 
It's a powerful word. It's the removal of barriers, amen, to bring harmony. We need that kind of revival in our nation, amen. The liberation revival focuses on gaining freedom. It, then we keep moving on. The last one, the prayer revival. I know places right now that are still praying. We got men that show up at our, our camp. They come in for 24 hours just to pray. They pray every morning for one another. They pray for people every morning. They, they're going to be using our ranch. They did last year. They're going to do it again this year. There's something about just getting in the presence of God and just praying. So there's all kinds of revivals that take place. It's because of appetite. Everybody say appetite. How's your appetite? How's it been? Amen. A holy appetite. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for right things? It means to cultivate an appetite for righteousness within ourselves, in our relationships, in the body of Christ, and in the world. Jesus, when you study Jesus, he saved his most scathing rebukes for those who pay inordinate attention to maintaining external rules. All about the rules. We just got to do the rules while being judgmental with the rules, uncaring with the rules, inflexible with the rules toward real people in complex and difficult situations. I've got to see that person and where they're at and say, God, what is it that they need at this moment? Jesus had a strong word for legalists who refused to interrupt the Sabbath to be kind to other human beings, who misused their power and prestige in the name of God to put a yoke on people to tell you, you can't work on the Sabbath, you can't cook on the Sabbath, you can't get your ox out. You know, it's funny to me that when you read the miracles of Jesus, most of them happen on the Sabbath. He was always breaking that Sabbath rule. Amen. He was always doing something to upset the religious people. But whose hypocrisy prevented people from entering the kingdom of God? Jesus even made one statement one time. He said, you know, the IRS, that was what they called, the tax people and the prostitutes will get into heaven before y'all. <laughs> My God. God, I love Jesus. When we hunger for things to be right and explore what that means in our lives, we are right in the middle of this beatitude, hunger and thirst. They're, they're unpleasant experiences. If I can encourage you that sometime over the next few months, take some time to fast, to take away that, that just always, the more I stuff down, the less I have an appetite. But when I take a break, and I say, you know what, body? You, you're not going to get to eat anything you just want to eat. And by doing that, I create appetite inside of me. Amen. When I'm hungry, here's my problem. I'm grumpy. Mm -hmm. Irritable. Quick. Mm. No patience. If I persist, I become weak. It's the same for hunger of the soul. When my need to be in right relationship with God and others goes unmet, I grow spiritually lethargic. When you quit being hungry after God, you get lazy. You procrastinate. You don't read. You don't witness. You don't pray. Amen. There's no passion for God because now there's no hunger for God. And what we've done is we fill these voids with so many different things. But there's all, listen, there's a hole inside of us that only God can fill. Amen. So, so here's the thing. In, when my need to be in right relationship with God and others grows, I become lethargic. So how's that blessed? It feels more like pain and frustration. How do these appetites result in being filled? Our first thing is to trust that our spiritual hunger, our desires and needs are good things. Jesus used these two things, hunger and thirst, which is food and water. They're metaphors for a longing in a world where every emptiness is not yet filled. He knows when we hunger for what, what is right and what is good. It's important to our spiritual needs. Here's the thing. Name your hunger. Name it. Give it a name. What are you hungry for? Some of you parents are hungry to see your kids blessed and come to God. Some, some of you young people are hungry to see your parents change and become more like what they think they are, say they are at church. Hunger. We would ask them to name what they wanted. Say it out loud. I, I'll say it like this. What you want? What is it you want? Mark chapter 10, verse 51. They spent some time in Jericho. Jojo, I'm fixing to start closing here. They spent some time in Jericho as Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples and a parade of people. A blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting along the road. When he heard that Jesus, the Nazarene, was passing by, he was blind, but he could hear well. When he heard that the Nazarene was passing by, huh, how did he hear and know through all that crowd and all them people that it was Jesus. Somebody was saying his name. Somebody was proclaiming him. 
Come on, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. This way, Jesus. And with his eyes blind, he heard. Amen. And he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, mercy. Everybody say mercy. mercy. Now shout mercy. mercy. See, there's hunger in this man. He's fed up. He's tired. He did, I don't want to be this way anymore. I'm tired of begging. I'm tired of sitting on the side of the road, somebody else taking care of me. Amen. Codependent on what other people want to do in my life. So he yells out, mercy. And then I love this next verse. He says, have mercy on me. So he yelled at Jesus. Jesus. So he wasn't saying mercy. He was calling Jesus mercy. Now again, blessed are they that are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So he's yelling at Jesus, mercy, have mercy on me. Many tried to shut him up. Hush up. Be quiet in church. Don't go after that. Set, just settle down. Talk to you later. Mercy, have mercy. They tried to shut him up, but he yelled the louder. See, that's hunger. That's hungry. Amen. Got to have it. I want it more than anything. I will pay whatever price. See, the issue with revival or awakening, first off, it's messy. Second, it's expensive. It's expensive. Third thing is, I want you to know this, revival doesn't always last. So you've got to learn to live by faith. Amen. So here he is. In other words, the feelings leave. Where are the feelings? Where were the feelings at? Where are the tears at? Where's the laughter at? It goes, but that's okay because now God's teaching you to live by faith. Many tried to hush him up, but he yelled all the louder, Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped in his tracks, called him over. They called him, it's your lucky day. Get up, he's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus and said, and Jesus said, what can I do for you? What is it you want? <laughs> Excuse me? What is it you want? See, at this moment, I'm thinking it's obvious. But he wants to hear him say it. I see people, it's obvious what you need. It's, uh, you need healing. Your mind is playing messes with you, telling you life ain't worth living. You need one more day. You need hope. You need hope for your family and your future. You say, well, if I, I just need money. No, you don't need money. Amen. You need opportunity to provide for yourself and family. Amen. That's what you need. Amen. Money can hurt you if you don't use it right. It's simply a tool. What is it you need? Name your hunger. What is it you want? And he said, I want to see. I want to see. And Jesus said, on your way, your faith, look at that word. Your faith has healed you. Faith is reaching into somewhere. Faith, what the scriptures say in Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Can I tell you? Day in and day out, they placed that blind man. He didn't get there on his own. Somebody put him there. And every day, by faith, he's thinking, it's the evidence of things not seen. It's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to be healed. I'm hoping to see. I'm hoping. That I, who knows? Did he have family? Who knows that he saw before and now he was supposed to see again? I just want to see. And Jesus said, on your way, your faith has healed you. <laughs> In that very instance, he recovered his sight. And what did he do? He followed Jesus down the road. <laughs> Amen. Everybody knew blind Bartimaeus. Now he, he's Bartimaeus who can see. Name your hunger. He threw off his beggar's coat. I'm hungry. Have mercy. His life changes from that day forward. He was blind. Amen. He had a cloudy perspective. 
this needy man's willingness to state what he wanted opened the door to receiving the blessing Jesus offered. It's being happily hungry. They that hunger and thirst, I can't make you hungry. I can't make you thirsty. I can help you and encourage you to come to the house, but I'm telling you this, you got to be hungry. If nothing changes, nothing changes. About 10, 12 days ago, I decided I got to get some weight off. I just made up my mind. I just going to do it. So I did. Been after that now for 10 days. I got, got to do more because I'm going to travel a lot in August. I'm going to eat good. But there are times I sit at night and I go, man, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You, you know what sounds good? Anything. <laughs> Anything. See, when, when you're no longer hungry, you, you're picky. Sometimes I come to church. And, and listen, this morning was fantastic. Worship was fantastic. But let me be honest with you. I've been in church now for 40 years. There are times I've come to church and, oh, my God, that's the worst worship music I've ever heard in my life. But I didn't care because I was hungry. I was hungry. You sing bringing in the sheaves. I don't know what the sheaves is, but I'm going, I'm, I'm hungry. And blessed assurance, hallelujah. Amazing grace, yes, 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 yes. Amen. I'm hungry. When you're not hungry, it don't matter what goes on up here. You, know, you don't get into it. But when you're hungry, God, I'll take whatever you've got today. If it's liver and onions, hit me with it. Oh, just once. It's balance. Blessed people carry with them this great tension of the believer's life. They live between realism and idealism. I want you to look at that. This is where my life is. I, I'm, I, this is who I am. I live right here between realism and idealism. I have this idealistic idea of what church and life should be like. Amen. How it should be. But then there's reality. I got to get up in the morning. I got to go to work. I got to take care of this. I got to do that. I got to look after my family. I got to look after my grandkids. Amen. I got to make sure the staff is good. And, and how, how's the church folk doing? I got to go to the hospital. This is my realism. Amen. But then I have this idealism that someday everybody I know is going to love God. Amen. There won't be no more fighting. There won't be no more race issues. There won't be no more culturally fighting. Amen. Everybody going to be able to bless one another. That's my, I, I have that. So I live somewhere in between those two. Amen. Believe in God. I, I, I'll say it like this. I believe I'm a supernatural realist. I'm a supernatural realist. Amen. I believe in it, but I believe in the supernatural, but I'm a realist. They've come to terms with the groaning nature of this between place that we're at. Amen. This borderland that we live in. They're also the ones who sense a deep well of peace, joy, and hope. These people that are hungry, happily hungry. We are thankful for the feeling of, re of freedom that revivals, awakenings bring. But we also understand we've got to live by faith. We acknowledge our hunger in God's presence and in the presence of others. And to allow it to motivate an honest search for what is truly right in any situation. That is the stuff of the real spiritual life. When I come to church and I lift my hands and I worship God, I'm telling God, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. What parent has not brought their kids out to see a bird nest and to see them baby birds with their mouths opened, knowing that nothing else can feed them but their mama? And mama comes back, and mama might be hungry. But her first instinct is to feed them baby birds. And she'll drop that worm in on top of that bird, and that bird will just swallow it up. Amen. Them little mouths straight up just like that. And there are times I come to church, and I'm just like, I say, God, feed me. Give me revelation. Give me understanding. I'm, I'm out mowing the grass. Give me revelation. Give me understanding. Amen. Help me understand how to be a better pastor, a better man, a better husband, a better, a better father, grandpa. So I'm going to close with these thoughts. First, to have hunger, we can't love a person you don't know. If you don't know Jesus, you can't love him. you got to know him. you got to invite him into your life. you got to say, God, I, I, you know I'm a, I'm a mess. I need you. And we'll tell you what happens. You'll have an awakening. God will begin to wake you up. Amen. He'll begin to stir things. Second, you got to remove the barriers between us and him. You can't focus with something between us. These barriers are removed when we confess our sins and God forgives us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. I believe that. I 
I believe that God took my sins away. I believe that God can purify us from all unrighteousness. Hear it. Your good works and looks, reformed lives and best intentions will never take away the guilt of sin. Only the blood of Jesus. So I believe that. I believe every sin we've ever committed, when we ask God to forgive, He washes it away. He removes those barriers. The third thing, ask for hunger. Be consistent. Tell God you're hungry. Amen. You're thirsty. John 17, 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. Now, I wasn't born. I was sent here. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. God will never love you anymore than he loves you right now. And you can't do anything to take that love away. When my children were helpless, and I look at you, Steve, and I see your grandpa feeding that baby. That baby don't even realize how much you love that baby. And you'll always love that baby. And that baby's helpless right now without you. You need somebody to feed it. Amen. That's like, I, I can't, how do, you, how do you explain that? How do you explain having a baby and all of a sudden you just fall in love with that kid? And you realize for the rest of your life you're going to spend a million bucks taking care of that kid. No, you don't realize it then, but you, it'll, it'll accumulate. Amen. You'll look after them and look at and love them and care for them and then the grandkids show up and then you wish you had to spend all the money on the first one so you could you can change your mind but only the Holy Spirit can change your heart Romans 5 5 and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us stand with me There's coming a day in which you will be removed from this place. <clears throat> and my hope is that all of us will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And it won't be, it won't be because you are such a great follower. It will be because he's a great leader. Well done. I want you to think just for a minute. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? Name your hunger. Mercy! Have mercy. Bartimaeus, what is it you want? I want to see. I want to see. And whatever you're hungry for, I believe God will bless you with it, fill you with it, grant it to you. If it's healing, if it's opportunities for finances, if it's relationship, what are you hungry for? Now, I know the embarrassment of yelling out loud because somebody in front of you might hear it. And if they hear it, then all of a sudden now it could start gossip. And I don't want no gossip in this house. I, but I want to know this. What are you hungry for? What is it inside of you? <laughs> You're hungry for. You got a wayward child, a prodigal? What are you hungry for? What is it? Come on, just lift your hands toward him right now. God, take away our reproach, our sin, these beggar clothes that we got. I no longer want to be begged and codependent on people. God, I want you. I want you. I'm hungry. Now, whatever it is you're hungry for, just go ahead and say it before him. doesn't have to be loud, screaming, not trying to embarrass nobody. What are you hungry for? God, I'm hungry to see the church reconciled. I'm hungry to see our nation healed. I'm hungry to see you wipe the, 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 the face of, of this nation, Lord God, that's turned away from you, that's turned into such liberal attitudes, nonchalant, hurting others. God, change our nation. Turn us around. I'm hungry for you, God. I'm hungry to see our teenagers passionately in love with you. To see our kids worship and enjoy the presence, not just you, but their family again. God, reconcile families. Bring us back together. God, put within the Father a heart for their children again. Don't bring curses on the earth. God, please, put the heart of the Father back toward the children again. We're hungry for change. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. 
Jesus' name. Everybody say, mercy. mercy. Have mercy. mercy. One more time. Mercy. mercy. Have mercy. mercy. Amen. Come on, give God a praise in here.